All right, we are live. <clears throat> Welcome to night two slash three, depending on what conference championships you're talking about, uh, of the first week of the 2023 conference championships. There's a lot going on. Let's talk about it. Uh, Yin Yin, give me, give me your number one highlight of the night. Oh, God. My number one highlight of the night has got to be Kate Douglas breaking the American NCA US Open record in the 100 fly. And then right after that, Maggie McNeil goes 48 9. So they were within within a tenth of each other. And it was the fastest and fourth fastest performances of all time. It almost feels like a back and forth between Mag McNeil and the UVA woman. It's like the UVA woman go first and then it's like your turn, McNeil. And <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I can't believe we are to the point where we had two women go 48 in the same night. Right. Yeah. And it's like one, one overshadows the other. I mean, that's just, it's exceedingly historic. Uh, Kate Douglas clipping the record by hundredths. Was it one one hundredth, three one hundredths? It was five one hundredth. Okay. Um, I mean, just just getting under that record. Um, and then her teammate, Gretchen Walsh, going 49-3 to boot. Uh, Gabby Albiero is like, you know, playing third fiddle at 50.0. Uh, the depth we're seeing is is unprecedented. Um, I mean, it's 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 pretty crazy. And you know, Maggie gets out after that swim at SECs where I am, and she's pretty unimpressed, right? I mean, and it's the same thing last night where we saw twenty point eight American record from Gretchen Walsh. McNeil goes twenty point nine, and she was just like, "Yeah, I kind of thought I'd be faster. I think NCs is going to go better." You know, it's it's like it's there's so much fast swimming right now, but this is almost just like, this is setting everything up for NCAAs. Like this is just a preview of what could come, which is just bonkers because, uh, we had our swim swam pulse this week was how many <laughs> American or NCAA or us open records were going to get broken during conference season. You we've know, got four already, if you're we've got four these. in three days <laughs> and, uh, I, there could be more, this could be it. I mean, it's, it's never really guaranteed. Um, but the, the McNeil versus Douglas showdown is going to be epic. Okay. So what do you think right now? Does Douglas swim 50 free or two? I am at NCs. Oh my God. I wrote an article about this last night. I am on team K Douglas 200. I am because I think she's a lot better than 150.1. And that's crazy. To say because 150.1 is the second fastest performance ever, but I'm thinking her best time before this was from November 2020, and that's 0.77 seconds slower. And think about who she is as a swimmer now and who she was in 2020. She's so much faster than she was in 2020 all around. I think she can be more than. 0.7 faster in the 200 I am. I th you know what? Prediction time. I think she has a 148.9 in her. 148.9. That's my prediction if she swims at NCAAs because she dropped two seconds from 2021 to 2022 at Short Course Worlds. And given, I mean, I guess since she's like less, ex less experienced in Short Course meters, so she's going to drop more. But I think she has a 148.9 in her if she goes all out and has her best race ever. I mean, I don't disagree. I think she could have a Dressel esque performance at NCAAs, um, given her track record and given how fast she's been all year. But that's also the thing that kind of scares me or, or makes me hesitant because we don't really know what a taper can, like, how much can she taper? You know, like, especially with her build, it's like, she doesn't have a ton of muscle to taper down. You know, it's like she just swims fast all the time. And obviously, do I think she'll go faster at NCs? Yeah. But how much faster, I'm not as much sold on yet. But, I mean, I think I think if she hits it at NCAAs, 
I don't think 148.9 is outside the realm of possibility. I mean, you think about how much faster she can get. Looking at last season, which was already an incredible season for her, she got progressively faster from mid-seasons to ACCs to NCAAs. And, I mean, if she follows the same improvement curve this year, I don't see why hitting that perfect taper isn't out of the question because her swims are going on that same improvement curve this year. She was... um. She was fast at dual meets, even faster at mid-seasons, even faster at ACCs. So I don't see why not. Because she has she hasn't – I don't think she's ever had an NCAAs where she added time from conferences. And that's very rare. But, yeah, I'm banking on her to drop more. So this begs the question. That's day one, or day two technically. Day three of NCAAs. If she swims 100 fly, is it her or Maggie? I don't know. I could not tell you. I got to go with Maggie. <laughs> <laughs> I I think Maggie McNeil. The, so the epic part about this is that this could be their both of their last NCAAs. It absolutely is Maggie's and she knows it and she's stayed, you know, she's talked yeah. about it. She wants to go out on top. She wants to leave the hundred fly record in a place that it's not going to get touched for a while, which I think she will do. Uh, and I think if if Kate has a Dressel esque, um, like two Dressel circa 2018 NCAA's, maybe she maybe she gets Maggie. I don't think again. I think it's possible. But right now, I would say Maggie. I think she's 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 looked great all season. As is Kate. Really, it's a coin toss. I mean, how do you how do you pick one over the other? And you've also got a factor in Tori Husk and Claire Curzon and everyone else that's been sub 50 this the year. Stanford it's, it's not, just a, not just a two person race. Uh, to me, it is. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, the Tori Husk is the world champion. Uh, Claire Curzon obviously is having a great year and has great underwaters. But to me, Kate and, and Maggie right now are a step above especially with what they've put up the credentials they have i mean maggie is world champion for 2019 short course meter champion yards champion olympic champion you know i mean she's done it all and um it's hard for me to bet against tori husk but i think it's going to come down to maggie versus kate it's really crazy to me how this ncaa's is probably going to be the last ncaa's for Douglas and McNeil because Douglas was last year's swimmer of the year and McNeil was the 2021 swimmer of the year. I'm thinking about the CSCA awards. And honestly, I was looking back at some of the past winners. And I think this, at least on the woman's side, this is the first year in a while where the last two swimmers of the year were competing against each other in the same meet, especially in their last meet ever, like one last ride. It just feels crazy. Like we're going to be in for something incredible between the two of them. Well, absolutely. Especially since uh, a 2021 NCAAs, you know, NCAAs the year prior had been canceled because of the, the COVID-19 pandemic. And so this was the first NCAAs in two years. And on the women's side, like, that was the matchup because they went head to head for three rounds, 50 free, 100 fly, 100 free. And like that was what everyone was looking forward to. And it panned out storybook, you know, I mean, it was like Douglas nabs the 50 free, then McNeil nabs the 100 fly. And so then it comes down to the 100 free on the last day. And it's like, all right, who's going to take it, McNeil or Douglas? And you know, ultimately McNeil came out on top, but like that <clears throat> was, that was the headline for that NCAAs. And so to have the potential of that again, and to, again, in the women's hundred fly to have a race like that, where you have so many women who have been so yeah. fast. When we start doing NCAA preview articles, I am going to be in my writing. I'm going to be hyping up that rivalry so hard. Oh my God. <laughs> It's, I mean, it's a great one. And like we said, it's, it's been, it's years in the making at this point. Yeah. So, all right. Outside of the women's hundred yeah. fly, 
Let's talk about the men's hunter fly. Yeah. Can we talk about the fact that NC State has three men sub 45 and one guy 45 one? Like you don't when you think of NC State, you don't really think of a team that's super. I mean, they've always been good at the 100 fly, but you don't associate NC State with 100 fly depth. But their depth in the 100 fly is incredible because Aiden Hayes went 44 6, Niels Corstane went 44 7, Arsenio Bustos, who's having one heck of a meet, dropped two seconds and went 44 9, and then Kasper Stokowski went 45 1. Like, that's crazy. Yeah, I mean, they, they really showed out in that event. And they didn't even win. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yusuf Ramadan just put on mm-hmm. a dominant performance, recorded a 4393, just three one hundreds off of his own meet and conference record in that event. Is that a yeah. meet record? Anyway, it doesn't matter. No, Sorry. It's not a meet record, but it's um yeah, off right off his conference record from NCAs last year. Okay. Um and th- <laughs> I didn't even see that. I saw the other 100 fly showdown uh, where we saw Josh Leendo and Jordan Crooks go head to head once again, which the, I mean, these two sprint talents are so fun to watch. Crooks was 44 0 in prelims this morning. He ended up going 44 3 and getting second to Leendo, who was 44 1 tonight in finals the, with the patented Florida no breather last 25. <laughs> And so already between those two heats, we have, or those two meets rather, we have six guys who who are 44. And that's just in two conferences. Yeah. Crazy. To me, the 100 fly at SECs, that was a statement swim for Josh Leendo because I feel he's been overshadowed a bit by Jordan Crooks this year. I mean, it's crazy to say Josh Leendo out of all people is being overshadowed considering that he's probably the most high profile freshman, at least on the men's side coming into this season. But yeah, cause Crooks was beating him a lot in the 50 free and Crooks beat him in prelims. And I think everyone was expecting Crooks to get under 44, but it was Leendo that showed up and won. And in previous races, Leando was also adding time from prelims to finals, but he dropped this time. So it kind of shows like, oh, Jordan Crooks saying, I can win titles. I can beat Jordan Crooks. I can drop. I can be, I can improve. That So it was a really big statement swim from him, in my opinion. I agree. I mean, I think Leando has had a heck of a season um, as a freshman, uh, coming out of Florida, you know, he, he's been dropping times that are really impressive, but then Crooks has been on a whole nother level, but you, I feel like this kind of illustrates their differences, right? We know Crooks has incredible speed, incredible underwaters, uh, incredible mechanics and Leendo on top of the water has proven that he is, he is with the best, you know, he's a world championships medalist in the 100 free and 100 fly um and so long course and so he 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 knows <laughs> how to move on top of the water and uh you know on that last 25 i think crooks tightened up a little bit and leendo literally put his head down the whole 25 and got him but i think that rivalry is going to be great i talked to josh tonight after the race and he was he, I, Sadly, I am leaving SECs tonight, but he's like, dude, you know, 100 free. It's going to be the tiebreaker. And he was really excited about that race because I think it is that is like a, a great middle ground for those two guys of like speed versus endurance. And uh, it's going to be an exciting race. At NCAAs last year, the 100 fly was if on the men's side was a crazy event. And it's this year, it's better. it's just going to get crazier. Um, yeah. And the weird part is that all these guys are going really fast. No one's really approaching Dressel's record like we had kind of said at the beginning of the year might be a possibility yet. But everyone keeps one-upping each other. You know, everyone's kind of inching closer and closer to that. Yeah. So 
Fair warning, I actually haven't watched the 100 fly race between Crooks and Leando. I just got home less than an hour ago. Um, but I can see where your point, Coleman, about how Leando's better over the water. And I think that's where his long course international experience comes into play and benefits him in situations like these, especially as the distances get longer and there's less, there's still a lot of emphasis, but less emphasis on underwaters and walls than a 50. Yeah. And and I think that's just going to, I think both swimmers are just going to get better as we move into NCs. I mean, I I would put money on the fact that both will be 43 plus at NCAAs. This could be, how many 43s do you think we could see at NCAAs? Because right now, those two swimmers have not been 43. However, (laughs) you have three or four swimmers already. Three last year, but Orlando's out. So (laughs) it's two from last year. So that's and that's Yusuf, Yusuf Ron, Ron, Minikoff, and um, Andre Minikoff. And I think Crooks and Liendo are gonna be forty three as well. And then Niels Korsdane went forty four zero last year, and I think he's gonna drop down to sub forty four. So that's I'm predicting. I'm predicting five sub forty four this year. Ooh, that is crazy. <laughs> Uh, so again, that's going to be <laughs> an exceedingly tight race as well. Uh, yeah. and which will come down to a touch I'm guessing. So I don't know guys, if, uh, if you haven't perfected the no breather last 25, you might want to do it because I think that might be the kicker in that race. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, so outside of the hundred flies, I mean, those were the big races, mm-hmm. Anything else that that really stuck out to you tonight, or that impressed you from all 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 big conference meets? I'm just thinking and looking at some of the team battles, and there's a lot of teams that are surprising me a lot. For example, on the SEC women side, the Florida women are leading by nearly oh, 300 man. points. They're yeah. probably honestly, I think they're they're leading the rest of the field more than the Florida men are, which is crazy because the Florida women weren't even favorited to win. And then on the ACC side, Notre Dame won two out of the three events. Chris Giuliano won the 200 free and then Jack Hoagland won the 4IM. So they're sitting in fourth. They're ahead of UVA right now, who we expected to finish ahead of them. And then on the big 10 side, uh, we haven't really talked that much about Big Tens, but there's, I think, Michigan, Ohio State, and Indiana are separated by 20 points, so it's very tight. And that's also another surprise, considering that Ohio State was utterly dominant last year and won by, like, 100 points, more than that. So a lot of team battles going on. A yeah. lot of team surprises. The and I'm surprised that there hasn't been more talk about the Florida women. Um, you know, yeah, like you said, they weren't the favorite to win, but like we weren't even they weren't really even in the conversation. Uh, if if there were conversations being had about the SEC women's side, but holy crap, <laughs> I mean, and it's not like uh Emma Wyant won the 400 I am tonight, but like you said, they're in the lead by almost 300 points. Like the depth is just incredible. They had depth. They had three in the top five in the 4IM. And then in the one fly, they had one in the A final. And then in the 200 free, they also, they had three in the A final and they were all top six. And I think they're diving if I'm not mistaken, is pretty good. They had someone finish second in the one meter. And yep. yeah, so just overall very deep, especially in those freestyle and distance events. Yeah, the, those mid-distance events that we kind of associate with Florida. Uh, I mean, they're just, they're rocking and rolling. So kudos to them, seriously. They have 600, so, sorry, 760 points on the board after three nights of con, there's still two more nights to go. Mm-hmm. 
Um, so yeah, the, these team races are heating up. Women's Big Tens uh, surprised me a little bit. A because it seems like people are barely even interacting with our live recap, which almost <laughs> never happens with the conference meet. But it's like when it's the when it's playing third fiddle, you know, in conference meets um, by I guess popularity, but also like times. You know, it's like. 438 yeah. won the five, which is solid. 154 nine won the two IM. Again, pretty solid. 21 eight, the 50 free solid. But, you know, it's like if you're not like going, going times that are just blowing us away, then it's like, oh, yeah, cool. All right. <laughs> Big tens. I mean, also, it's women's only. So half the excitement as a combined. That is true, which I'm I'm really glad that ACC's has has gotten on the yeah. combined bandwagon. I think I mean, SEC's is a meet unlike any other. It's absolutely mm -hmm. my favorite conference meet to go to just as a, a fan of swimming because the energy is off off the charts. Like Big 12's is combined. ACC's is now combined. I don't I think Big 10's and uh, Pac 12's should do the same because I feel like it just makes it easier for yeah. everyone. Pac-12 needs to combine because really even do. though literally everyone's going to be leaving the Pac-12 in two years, it's still a very underrated conference in my opinion. Well, and they have it at Federal Way every year, which yeah. could, you know, it's it's that's a facility that's like Greensboro or like some of the, sorry, SEC conference uh, hosts where like it's big enough where you could combine it and I feel like it would make life easier for the coaches first and foremost. Yeah. Speaking of big tens, Coleman, do you have any big takeaways from that meet? Cause even though there weren't as many fireworks as SECs and ACCs, I still think it's a pretty fun meet to follow, especially with the team battle that's going on. It's closer than SECs and ACCs in terms of scoring. <clears throat> Agreed. Uh, I mean, I think it's f it's been fun to watch Ohio State's depth just carry them for the last few seasons. And I think we see that on display once again, like in the 50 free, they had four of the top five and they finished. Then they went one, two, three. So they swept the podium as well as Nia Thunderbird getting fifth, who if you know, if, if you haven't followed her story, yeah. qualified for NCAAs last year after not making the conference team. And so they are incredibly deep, especially in some, some events other than others, but also it's just fun to, uh, to see some names pop up. I mean, Minnesota seems to be having a really strong meet. Megan Von Burkham got third in the 200 IM. Um, I'm learning new names. Abby Carlson from Wisconsin, 438-1 to win the 500. Wisconsin just pops out a new 500 freestyler every year because they've got three potential NCAA scores in that event with McKenna and Blair Stoneberg and now Abby Carlson. Which I, which I do think is, is Yuri's kind of specialty. He's, you know, he, he was a distance swimmer himself. He, I know when he, he obviously trained Ledecky, Katie Ledecky, among others, when he was coaching at NCAP, mm -hmm. uh, when he coached at Cal, he was, he was in charge of that upper group. And then coming to Wisconsin, it seems like that's where he's kind of shined. And uh, obviously Paige McKenna winning the NCAA title last year in the mile. It's, it seems like they, they've they got that distance, mid-distance thing figured out in Wisconsin. But just seeing some new names at Big Tens throw down really solid times. Uh, I'm just curious to see how the Big Ten will react to NCAAs because Again, other conferences are swimming so fast right now, and you have to think that the stars of Big Ten, like Mac Luz, Phoebe Bacon, uh, Paige McKenna, the those swimmers who are experienced and who have swam exceedingly well at the NCAA level, it's like, okay, what are they going to do in a month from now as opposed to now where they're just kind of swimming – pretty fast but not bonkers i wonder if the relatively slower big 10 times will contribute to maybe a different paper approach and help them maybe peak at ncas because big 10 is 
is the conference that's notorious for peaking at conferences and not swimming best times at NCA. So hopefully that won't happen this year as often. Yeah, maybe maybe that trend has <laughs> maybe that trend is uh, switched for the Big Ten finally. Yeah. So I think those are my takeaways from tonight. Um, anything else you've got, Yin Yin, before we sign off? I mean, yeah, just one last thing to add about Big Tens. This just makes me really sad that Jasmine Nelson TV isn't swimming because she's likely out for the season. And if she swam, she probably would have won the 50 free. Her winning time from, I mean, her time from mid seasons is like three, three times faster than the 50 free winning time. She probably could have done something really good in the um, 100 breast, 100 free as well. And Northwestern's kind of struggling. They didn't get anyone in the A finals today and I just think they would be better with her and she just has so much potential but every single year something not good happens to her and she can't compete at big meets what happened last year uh last year I don't really know what exactly happened it may have been an issue with her shoulder but she swam really well at big tens and then she dropped out of NCAs for Uh, reasons yeah that's a big bummer (laughs) Well, uh, thank you for tuning in. Thank you, Yin Yin, for joining me on this uh, live recap. And keep tuning in. We've got two more big days of conference championships coming up.